Hello and welcome to the Pincast, the podcast presented by myself, Richard Bowser, editor and founder of Property Investor News, the monthly magazine which we launched 20 years ago back in 2002. If you want to listen to factual, no-nonsense interviews, insight and opinion from some highly experienced and respected property professionals, then this is the podcast that you really need to tune into on a regular basis. Hello, it's uh, Richard Bowser here from Property Investor News and welcome to our latest Pincast. So this morning, I'm delighted to be joined by a long-standing friend and business associate in Helen Chorley. Good morning, Helen. Good morning from Malta, Richard. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. A little bit chilly here in, in North Oxfordshire, but um, sure. we're looking forward to some sunshine in a few months' time, as I said earlier. So um, for those who have not uh, been reading Property Investor News in recent years, just to clarify that Helen Chorley, who is, as she says, a Malta-based investor, um, has been writing fairly regularly over the last three or so years for us. And, and actually, I did an interview with Helen back in early 2020. So literally four years ago, just yeah. before, of course, the um the awful pandemic hit us the world changed yeah yeah so helen um we, we talked in that article some four years ago in that interview about yourself and your career background so, so just re just remind viewers and listeners to this about who you are and and and, and, and what you do uh, as an investor in property Sure, absolutely. So uh, my background is investment banking and I came into property from that, that, that background. So came with a pot of money and I, I kind of believed that I, I could be passive or I could do passive. I could hand over my money to developers and go off and live, you know, in the sun in Malta and, and, and live happily ever after. And as we both know now, we all know now, that's not quite how it's worked out. Yeah. Um, I can't do passive for a start. And actually what I realized is that I could bring a lot from my background into kind of the world of property yeah. uh, and help people as well. So I'm also the co-founder of Property Sisters. Yes. As we realized that there was a community needed to support uh, female developers. So we've got Property Sisters and actually for newer people just on the journey, we've got Little Sisters as well now. And then obviously we've done a lot of work together um, being judges for Property Investor Awards. I'm a judge for the Women in Construction Awards with Michaela Wayne. Um, I've done numerous seasons of Property Elevator um, and then also recently done Venture Visionaries, which is more about venture capital with the lovely John Reynolds. So, yeah, I've some, done some TV and podcasts and I uh, most recently hosted Property Investor Awards back in December in London yeah. and absolutely loved that. So, yeah, lot, but involved in lots of different ways in property and investment and construction. Yeah. Well, as you say, you know, we've been working as, as judges on the Property Investors Award yeah. now for a good, good few years now, as I recall. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, I, I'm sure I can remember now, I think I think it was 2014 that started, so time flies by. Some great some great entries this year and, and uh, some obviously some brilliant uh, um, the, the projects that were, were put through and, and some very worthy winners this year so yeah look, look. yeah there was yeah. Yeah. Sam Patel swept the board with four awards which we've never had before Absolutely. Um, but lots of yeah lots of really really worthy winners and lots of women and lots more women entering and putting themselves up for awards which is what I particularly love to see as well so mm -hmm. it's, gr it's great to see you know it we both enjoy it as much as each oh, other, don't we? Just yes. understanding what people are doing and seeing how creative people can be with these projects. Yeah. Well, actually, I mean, uh, I'm actually meeting Sam next week at, at one of his really? projects, one of those that won one of the awards, because you say he won, he won multiple awards this year. Yeah. Uh, and in that interview and that article, we'll, we'll be going into uh, the upcoming magazine so look, looking forward to seeing that obviously I know quite a bit about it having judged like yourself uh, some of the, the the entries but uh yep. looking forward to seeing it in the flesh so oh, so yeah um so yeah so I mean you you've been investing 
as as an investor direct investor into other people's projects haven't you that's yes. basically where you come from yes um, you're not wielding a pick and a shovel on a site thank no <laughs> thankfully <laughs> that's not my no that's not my area of expertise i leave that to the people that know what they're doing yeah so the key skill sets that you bring from your career uh, in investment banking you know very how would you summarize that and, and what enables you to do what you do in terms of, of, of property investing? Well, obviously, with banking as my background, numbers is very, you know, that's that's the key, the, the what, what I'm really keen on and yeah. understanding. I'm, a, you know, self-invest spreadsheet geek. I love looking at the the numbers and understanding when you change numbers, what happens to the overall look of, of, of the return. Um and also what I did realize and actually how I got into that kind of speaking and presenting and everything um, in the property circuit was that I had an attitude to risk that I wasn't hearing other people talk about. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of people were talking about kind of strategies and different things you could do, but nobody was really speaking from the investor's standpoint, the investor being, you know, kind of a private investor who yeah. kind of lends money or goes into a JV. Yes. Um, but also like that way, that that attitude to risk. And I, what I realized was people didn't often completely understand all the risks they were taking. So that's that's what I said the two main things are. Yeah. Obviously, yeah, no, quite. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, yeah, generally speaking, as we know, a little bit like yield or whatever, uh, you know, the, 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 the the, the more the the greater the potential return, the more likely it is that there's a greater degree of risk involved. Um, yeah. and, and you know, it, it just straightforward. Um, it, what, you know, investing in central London against investing in in you know some remote part of the country where there's a very weak economy, but potentially there's 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 good a good deal. Uh, but obviously, yeah, you, 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 that, that, it correlates to the risk, doesn't it? Yeah. So, um, okay. So, what what? Helen, what sort of projects do you, do you typically investing in a, in in a given year? And um, to be honest, I don't have like um I don't set out with I want to do this deal or I want to do that deal. I very much base it on what the developer that I'm working with what their expertise is. So I've kind of done a bit of a bit of everything really flips I and mean, we've got a land deal on at the moment I've done loans I've done joint ventures where it's equity rather than yeah. a loan you know just a kind of fixed rate so I've done lots of different types of things and actually you know as definitely we've talked about and I think I've written about in the magazine as well like my risk appetite and the risk that I will take over time has changed as well yes. because I, I really believe in I've definitely written about this um kind of earning your right to risk so you don't plunge into something you know super risky as your first deal when you don't know what you're doing and you put all you know all your eggs in one basket I really I strongly advise against that I have seen people do that and it doesn't tend to work out too well you can get the odd lucky break but it's not something I would I would really recommend to be honest um so it really depends what the developers expertise and if I've got confidence that they can deliver what they say they will deliver then that's where I will begin to look and, and take a project seriously and then look to do more assessment on the numbers, whether it's the right type of deal project for that area, what the exits are, and look at all those, really get into the minutiae of the deal then. Mm. So, yeah, so so I, I think you, you've referred, both when we've spoken directly, but also within articles to 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 reinvesting or, or or investing on on multiple occasions with a developer that's proven proven their worth but but, yeah. but perhaps for, for people that are maybe coming into this space for the very first time maybe previously have done a couple of buy to lets or maybe they haven't they've suddenly got some uh some some money that they you know they've either taken from you know divesting a share portfolio or, or whatever uh, and yeah. inheritance in into directly investing with a developer and, and as you say Helen that, that there's you know there's so much in this marketplace in terms of promotion by via 
educators or from developers directly these days. It's in, there's an awful lot of social media activity directly yeah. from, from developers using all of the, the tools and techniques that are easily available now um, for, for marketing projects and marketing themselves. And there's some quite sophisticated marketing that goes on now um, yeah. online. So, you know, what, what so and on the back of that obviously there's this i could say there's a temptation to want to dive into the big stuff before you've cut your teeth on some straightforward stuff yes yeah there there really is and i think you're right like social media it can be a bit double edged it's great yeah. for developers and it's great for investors you know understanding what people are doing and building a story building a relationship kind of with the you know your, the audience or, or or who you're trying to get your message across to mm -hmm. but as with all social media you know it, it's it's one side of the generally it's one side of the equation so to be honest the people that I like in the property world on social media are the people that tell both sides of the story it's not always we're great we're smashing it we're winning these awards we're doing, it's like you know what this is tough have you seen what's happened to material prices um you know unexpected shocks this didn't happen this fell through this vendor pulled out or that we'll talk about the challenges as well because you know talking about the challenges doesn't sell courses generally no, does no, it no that's that's no absolutely yeah yeah yeah, it, yeah. It, it's along the lines of if it if it consistently sounds too good to be true, the likelihood it is. There, there's yeah the 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 smoke and mirrors type um, yeah. There, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors. There's still a lot of smoke and mirrors, even though yeah, I've been talking about it for a long time. And again, I think it was this was definitely in one article. I just take everything you're told, all social media. Um, and certainly at the beginning, when you are building that relationship with the developer, take everything with a pinch of salt. If it can then be backed up by evidence, by speaking to previous investors, by speaking to like the wider network, um, not just people that they want you to speak to. Yes. If those claims, those um, you know achievements, it can be verified elsewhere then you can start to be yeah to be a little more trusting but it's i i i tell you know some people call me cynical but um i find that's the safest way to be when you're putting a lot of money on the line yeah, and wow. you then you really have to be it's your money at the end of the day it's up to you to do that due diligence so when when you invest with a developer and obviously you can i think you've said previously uh, or you said to me previously years ago, you know, you, you had done or had done in the past sort of crowdfunding uh, type yes. investing, which obviously can be, you know, relatively small sums of money. And lots of yep. people are doing that. And lots of people have been doing that consistently and successfully o over uh, o over quite a number of years now. Yeah. Um, yep. But of course, and, and there's safety in the crowd, isn't there? But also... But to a degree <laughs> yes there, there is and that's exactly as you say that's how I got started I literally I can't remember what my first deal exactly was but it was around about a thousand pounds like you can dip your toe in the water and I think that's a really good way of yeah. getting started whether it's through crowdfunding or whether it's with a developer you know kind of directly yeah. um but crowdfunding as you say gives you access to do it at those smaller you know, uh, less kind of substantial amounts. Um, and it's a good way of learning about, about the whole process, yes. about what's involved, about what can go wrong, about the type of questions you should be asking, about what other investors are doing. And also you get to see if the developer delivers what they say they will deliver. And um, I've had a numerous deals that have gone superbly, still friends with those developers, still invest with them to this day. And I've had a couple of absolute clangers as well. And thank goodness I only put in small amounts because, again, there was, there's, you know, 
<laughs> yeah, several examples of where the social media and the story and, you know, the smoke and mirrors was all there and it was great. But actually the ability of that developer to deliver just wasn't there. So thank goodness I, I did that through crowdfunding and it was only small amounts. Yeah, no, quite. Yes, yeah, so sometimes small is beautiful is a good good analogy. And and um, as you say, you know, depending on the platform and, yes. and the due diligence of the platform as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's also key of, of who they bring to the table. Um, yes, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, so it, 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 that's another thing maybe that people need to to consider. Um, yeah, and the only thing I would say about on, on my like slight kind of caveat about crowdfunding, it's not about the, the the platforms themselves or the projects, is that sometimes people themselves will kind of outsource their due diligence they will they'll put all their responsibility for the due diligence on the crowdfunding platform and obviously they do do their due diligence yeah. and they can go to a certain extent but if it's your money I, I you know I've said it once already if it's your money it's your responsibility to 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 investigate that to do as much background work as you can don't outsource that to any platform to anybody else um, and that's the only bit I don't like about crowdfunding that people are like oh well they're doing it or oh, all these people have put money in so it should be okay yeah Th there's no guarantees that you know it's it's on purpose that there's small print in yeah. these things that say it's up to you to do to you to do your due diligence Absolutely. well you know it, in old school terminology it's your signature on the checkbook Exactly. Check. And, and yeah, it's all very well quoting safety in numbers, but, you know, a herd of lemmings going over a cliff isn't necessarily a good crowd to join. <laughs> and we've seen some of those, haven't we, sadly? So, yeah, no, no, absolutely. Yeah. No, I mean, we, without naming names, we, we know of a number of uh, uh, individuals um, yeah. that have unfortunately um, taken people's money and, and not applied it in, in the right way. And, and those investors have... have uh, suffered accordingly okay so um yeah some some words of of uh good, good, good yeah some words of caution understandably because it, as as at the end of the day once once you press that button and it's gone from your bank account into the developer or through the intermediary uh, or through the platform um then uh, getting it back can be a costly um d difficult process sometimes yeah yeah really so so You've already hinted at, you know, a few things or you've made some comments. So what typically do you look for in, you know, when as an in? I mean, I think you, with a developer themselves, I mean, you know, we, we talked about social media and, and, and how, and I completely agree with you about the, you know, the, you want to see the warts and all uh, yes. side of people it, it, rather than everything's great, everything's wonderful. Exactly. Yeah. You want to know that somebody will be transparent with you yeah. and and has that ability to, to to see. And basically they're in touch with reality because honestly, in this game, and you know better than me, Richard, yeah. some people aren't necessarily terribly in touch with reality. No. It's all rose tinted glasses. Yeah, and it is. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I love that. I love, you know, a developer needs that that they need that ambition, they need that self-belief. But as an investor, as a private investor, putting money with that person, you need to be able to discern how much of that ambition and that belief is grounded in reality and how much is it it kind of is is it is it wishing, is it is it hoping? Yes. Um and, yeah. and that's the that's the key, that's the critical kind of key points and and that's not as easy i wish yeah uh, i wish you know there were there were there were classes on exactly how to to nail that and identify that it's not quite that easy it comes with experience and actually it's why i do things the way i do them is that that gets easier to discern the more time you give yourself 
So the more you watch somebody, you watch them, watch them on social media and see are they telling both sides of the story. Watch and see how their developments are going. Watch and see how um, unhappy or happy their investors are. Watching somebody over a period of time shows everything. It really does. You can you can hide things. You can mask things. You can put on a brave face and have those royal tinted glasses on for a certain amount of time. But time will reveal all. Mm. And and that's why I tend to, you know, I, I meet somebody, I like them, the project sounds great. And I might invest a small amount and we'll see how that goes. And then if that goes well, then we'll go on to bigger things. T- time is your friend in this in this context. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that's the same principles that I apply when with with magazine interviews with people i i you know i i I trend tend not not to sort of you know go go with the latest you know person that suddenly sprung out of nowhere and and uh, is being highlighted in certain communities as a you know literally as a one-hit wonder or you know a particular strategy that all of a sudden is just a reinvention of something that's been done in a different, you know, for years. Um, but but they've got a, a suddenly a claim to fame. Um, yeah. So I, I I tend to I tend to look for time proven people. People have you know exactly. Shown their well, we we've, we've seen that as well, haven't we? As you say, you know, people come out of nowhere. They're the next hot thing. They everybody's talking about them. There's all the buzz. They're doing this. They're winning awards. They're all over social media, but is that sustainable yes you know sustainable like in an esg sense is you know is very kind of topical and it's something people are really focusing on but sustainability is deeper than that if you're giving someone your money and generally in development these projects are longer term they're going to have your money for a while is that person is that business as well as the project is that sustainable can they keep going and it's definitely something, you know, you ask about what I look for in a developer. It's definitely something I, I look for. It's a very different skill to run a business and to deliver a project. Can that person do both? Because if they can't run a business, then that jeopardizes the money and the deal. And again, I've I've seen this. Fortunately, I've not been um, on, on the, yeah, on the, bad side of that but I have seen somebody was great at developing they could find a deal they could get the angle they could get it built but they couldn't run the business they couldn't keep control of costs and ultimately that's what jeopardized all their projects and investors got hurt scaling up as you say that that that's where people that they and, and you referred already you know the developer mindset many many of them are very ambitious very driven yes very focused you know laser sharp mind and and focus on 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 uh, but it's when people start to scale up when they've got to delegate you know and and then you know their inability to 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 run the business as well as yeah. multiple projects and and yeah. yeah that that's when it can all Go, and, go. and ambition is great you know we love that but it has to be tempered again with that reality and, and again we've seen this haven't we people will go bigger and bigger projects and running multiple things well then exactly as you say you need a great team around yeah. you and juggling all those juggling one one project you know is is a big enough job juggling multiple in different parts of the country even maybe it's a whole different, literally different ball game. A lot more balls to keep in the air at once. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more there. So um just returning to your 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 whole approach to invest. I mean, you is it more now direct loan as opposed to joint venture? Because obviously equity type stuff can 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 come with additional risk. Yes, it it it's funny and it depends, you know. Over the whole time I've been doing this, obviously we've had different kind of risk environments, different interest rate environments. And when I started off, as we touched on with the crowdfunding, that was more JV, more like equity based um, deals. And what I realized or what was happening kind of at that that point in time, and we are going back to kind of 20, 
15, 16, around that time, is that because the ambitious, shall we say, rose tinted glasses um, um, quote of, of the expected time frame, because that wasn't met, the time frame ran way over, which is property, right? Yeah, That's yeah, that's not cool. uncommon. Yeah. Um, but because of that, the expected returns that you were getting on equity, which were projected at kind of, you know, decent 25, 30, often more than that percent. But if you're di if you're diluting that over, your, if you're expecting that in a year and then it suddenly becomes two years or three years or four years or yes. as infinitum yeah, in some cases, yes. then then your returns are decimated. So you've been taking equity risk on your money, uh, which is much higher risk than if it's secured against, you know, if there is an asset underneath it, if, there's, if it's um, a loan type, a that, that type of security. So I'm getting loan or even less than loan type returns and taking very high risk. And at that point, I could say there's this mismatch I'm getting not fabulous returns and I'm taking this risk. And it's like, actually, I could be taking this risk and I could be getting these returns. I'm like, that works for me better. So that's when I did a, a big switch over into much more um, loan, first and second charge lending. And I have to say, I've done some JVs recently, but I'm... I'm me at my stage of life it's just much more important that that money is secured you know we talk about it on our sunday chats with adam lawrence it's return of capital before return on capital that's what's important to me at this stage of life so and that's what i get it's what i'm more likely to get in the case of a loan the security it's asset backed there's something i can chase so that's my approach now Okay. And, and what would you say in terms of, you know, the developer, you know, it's going back to, you know, what are the, the sort of red flags that, that, that come up fairly typically with, with, because you're, you're, as you say, you're, 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 you're doing, you've done the TV programs and, and, and so you're the, the judging of the awards as, as other yeah. examples, you know, what, what are those red flags that make you go, Oh, seen this before. Yeah. Yeah, buyer beware. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we've touched on one of them already. Ambition, we need it. But where it's where it's lost touch of reality, where somebody is promising you the world and they can do it cheaper than anybody else, they can do it quicker than anybody else. And the the self-belief has gone into almost like aggrandizement, you know that there are a lot of, you know, narcissists in this world. Yeah. So you really need to watch out for those type of, yeah. of, of those are huge red flags. Um, and another way you can identify that is by asking somebody, and I always ask my developers this, like, what has gone wrong? What's your biggest disaster? What, you know, your biggest regret? Put them under a bit of pressure to see, will they answer the question? Yes. Because again, something I mentioned at the beginning, transparency. If somebody won't tell you and won't be open and honest about what their disasters are, and if they're in property, there has been a disaster. I'm telling you now, you, you and I both know that there has been a disaster. Will somebody be open and honest and tell you what that is? And actually, with a lot of my coaching clients, they're like, this has gone wrong or that didn't go wrong. How do I address that with an investor? I'm like, be honest there's a way of of explaining that but if you have done everything within your power to fix that to make the investor whole again if you've done right by your investor then that can actually be a way of building connection of building confidence and credibility with your investor so don't shy away from those conversations and i like to have those early on because you can see then how uncomfortable somebody is or not. Yeah. I remember one deal. I went up actually on a site visit to see um, the area of where this developer, um, his kind of niche, niche area. And I questioned 
it was it was very gentle it, but i just i questioned if this was the right style he'd gone for a real high design super duper you know some flashy architect super duper you know funky looking houses but it's it was in a rural kind of area and I'm, and i asked like are we sure there's demand for this style in yeah. this area what gives you yeah. that confidence and he got very defensive i i just thought that was a reasonable question that wasn't even me being you know hard-headed dragon's den angel investor you know like grilling down that was just that's a reasonable question to ask somebody and the, his defensiveness that i could question that mm. you know that that was red flags from the beginning for me with that one so so the the look at look out for the ego has landed ego is a very expensive hobby as um a previous podcast host <laughs> told me and that just stuck with me and it's it's watch that you know as we've said ev everybody has an ego like of, co sure. of course yeah. we do yeah. and of course there are a lot of them in property but is is there more to somebody than just the ego do they have humility as well can they admit they're wrong are they prepared you know to work with you how do they judge you know how do they value your money and what you want and your opinions if they're not going to listen to you you know and, and i am hands off i'm 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 People will ask me, obviously, now for advice and things. But other than that, I'm hands off. I, I like my developers just to get on and do their job. But if you have an opinion, will they listen to that? Will they give you the time to listen to your concerns, um, answer your questions, keep you updated? Well, that's, yeah, a that huge, was... that's a huge red flag and something to ask at the beginning. Or will they just disappear, get on with it and you're chasing and chasing to try and get information and updates like I mean that's just rude right yeah well it's just bad practice isn't it I mean I, yeah. you, know, you, you would expect a monthly update or or the worst a quarterly update depending on the length of the yeah. project but certainly regular communication and transparency yeah. as, as to what's going on yeah absolutely and if you have those needs and you want um monthly updates or however you want it Ask for those things up front. Get those things settled up front. Because then if somebody commits or they say, no, they can't commit to it, then you then you can have that discussion then. And then you can understand if they can't do, if they're a one-man band and they haven't got time to produce, you know, a beautiful looking investor report with pictures and da da da. I mean, that's kind of understandable. But yeah. what can they give you? Can you have, you know, half an hour phone call once a week and they go through everything? I mean, personally, I'd get something written down because if things do go wrong, you will need that that information. So I would always get things written down. Um, but but how willing are they to work with you? Um, and how will, are willing are they to stick to those things that they agree with you? Because it's a bit, you know, kind of a sales process at the beginning. The developer is trying to get the money in. They need to fund the deal. Of course they do. So they might promise you the world. Mm. And this is where it's really important to speak to previous investors. Do they promise you the world but fail to deliver? Because th that's no good for anybody. No, some great points there, Helen. Really, really good strong points there for people to think about you, you um, mentioned in the interview some four years ago about the what i think you referred to the rates and the rents and yes. we're obviously going into a, you know because we're not running this on a script but if people want to know about that we, we can put the link in in the show notes to to that article um about the fundamentals you know yes in in, in investing in deals it's just sorry. exactly that's still absolutely relevant as it was four years ago yes things have changed rates have changed but it's still relevant in terms of that's more actually when you're looking at the deal itself what are you looking at um and if i can remember the <laughs> if i can remember those things because it's also intuitive now but um return what returns are you getting uh, time is one of them because uh, again as as per the example if you've got a return over one year 
that's great. But by the time that extends to two years, then your return on your investment has halved. So you need to be, you know, mindful of that and, and work out what that looks like. And actually the W, the W in RENs is worst case scenario. What is your worst case scenario? Have that discussion. Look at those numbers. What if I, I obviously, we you know I'm a numbers geek. I like looking at a sensitivity analysis. If you're uh, developing something and it's going to be sold, what happens if prices go down? What happens if costs go up? What if both of those things happen at the same time, which we saw during COVID, didn't we? Yes, absolutely. What, what, does, what does that look like? Where is your break even? And at what point might that project need more money inputting into it? You need to know that. And the developer really does too. The developer should yeah. definitely have that. Yeah, yeah. Again, uh, yeah, great points. Yeah. There's things like exits, you know, as we talked about, is are you building the right type of project, the right type of housing for that market? Um, and again, as we touched on security, what is the security? And that will depend on whether you're doing a debt, a loan or an equity deal. What security is there? And I think we talked about PGs in that article. So yeah, we'll definitely add the link because yeah, it's all still super relevant. Absolutely. Yeah, it may be four years ago, but, you know, the fundamentals are the fundamentals. And yeah. I think just what's happened, you know, in that two year or so period with the pandemic, it just highlighted that that yeah. nothing can be taken for granted. You know, the yeah. student accommodation market, absolutely, with overseas students, developers. I mean, I, I did an interview recently with, with Ruth and with Ruth Hobbs and, and their project you know and that's just yeah. an, you know just an example of, of something that was going incredibly well yeah uh, and, and then all of a sudden you know the tsunami of, of COVID and its impact on on uh, uh you know that marketplace absolutely turned it upside down serviced accommodation the hospitality yeah. sector in that first yeah. year or so which, yeah. which was a massive roller coaster it went from you know, bust, boom to bust to boom. You know. <laughs> yeah. Um. And so any yeah. anybody doing developments around that type of project, you know, projects rather would would, would um the, the strategy would 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 certainly have, have, have gone through a bit of an emotional roller coaster. <laughs> oh my god, totally. And I think actually, you know, yes, we've all got horror stories from that time, whatever sector you were yes, in. Yes, but yes. that's the importance of of the network and speaking to people especially experienced people yeah. to understand you know kind of what happened what went wrong what couldn't you couldn't have been foreseen that happened because again you know I come from a, a, a risk mitigation a risk understanding risk background but there are every project there's something you're like oh I didn't ask that I wish I'd asked that every single time still yeah. all these years later so, and the, the checklist it's only, is constantly evolving is it oh oh Richard it started off it was quite it was quite thorough to begin with I was I'd say it started off 70 70 odd now it's about 200 like have we asked this and this and this so it just grows with every project but that's the beauty of experience and speaking yes. to people that have been around a long time. We've seen it all. And even if we didn't experience it ourselves, we, you know, we've got those connections and we've seen other people go through things. And more importantly, we've seen other people, how they've got out of it yes. or who they've connected with, who's helped them, who's got the answers to those challenges, to those problems that come up, because that's that's critical. You can have all the experience, but but at the end of the day, as you say, stuff comes along, and and your ability to seek help. You know the old, you know, no person is an island, and and you know there are times when we've got to reach out, and and yeah, and, you know, with with development, absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah, it's it's what I really love about like our property sisters community. There are really experienced women in there, and you know, kind of once or twice a week, somebody will pop up with it with a a really random and I'm like whoa I've never seen this question they're like ladies I've got this challenge going on has anybody else experienced this can you you know do you have suggestions on how I can handle that and everybody you know contributes and has something to to offer 
um which is it is it's just so lovely to have that support network around you because exactly you can think that you that this would be the best way to approach it but actually taking input from other people they'll have a different insight or a different perspective that you haven't got that actually could work out better Helen thank you very much for your time but Lan, the one final thing I must ask is how how can people get in touch with you um, so I have a website, HelenChorley.com. Uh, I'm most active on LinkedIn, Helen Chorley, or Instagram, Helen Chorley Investor. So give me a follow there. If you've got any questions, yeah, just connect with me there. And um, yeah, then you can go and look at my back catalogue on Property Investor News magazine. Indeed, absolutely. Uh, there's quite a number of articles there from there is. There's you, lots, put together, yeah. you put together with us in, in, in the last sort of three years or so. So great. Yeah. Helen Shawley, thank you so much for your time today. It's Richard Bowser. Always Bauer. a pleasure. Richard Bowser, Property Investor News. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this latest pincast from Property Investor News. Make sure you've subscribed to be notified when the next episode is released. Register for the PIN e new service at www.property investor news.com where you can also sign up as a magazine subscriber and get the monthly print magazine by subscribing to the magazine you can get access to 17,000 articles which we've published in the last 20 years alongside some 300 webinars and video interviews